thank you for being here. It's uh, good to be here today. I'm going to be talking about some ideas I've been working on uh, for powering the future of advertising using artificial intelligence and uh, consumer IoT data. My name is JP Abello. I'm a director of global engineering R&D for uh, IoT at Nielsen. How many people know Nielsen here at the company? Okay, so uh, basically what we do is we're a leading global independent measurement and data company for media, consumer behavior, and consumer goods. We've been around for over 90 years, and we've presented in more than 100 countries, and we provide a comprehensive understanding of what consumers watch and buy. Uh, in the US alone, we drive over $100 billion of advertising on radio, TV, web, and mobile via the Nielsen ratings. And advertising is actually um, a much bigger part of the US economy than most people think. Even though it's only about the $180 billion industry, uh, according to the INA and the Advertising Coalition, it drives uh, indirectly almost one-fifth of the US GDP. In the, uh, in the media markets, uh, it has a major impact because it supports financially um, all of the content, practically all the content that's being shown on print, radio, TV, uh, the web and mobile. And effectively, it makes uh, the content of it available to consumers at a greatly reduced cost and even free on the web, as we all know. The internet advertising part of uh, this industry has been by far the fastest growing. It was um, almost $60 billion last year. And this year, it's expected to exceed $72 billion. It will be bigger than all of TV uh, advertising put together. However, in the last couple of years, it has been under a major attack, a major threat in the form of the rise of, of uh, internet ad blocking by consumers. The IB reports that last year, almost 18% of web browsers were using ad blockers. And uh, with the younger demographics, especially the millennials, that uh, ad blocking rate is already almost two thirds. And these metrics, these numbers are expected to grow about 35% this year. The IB attributes this, uh, this basically to a, a uh, catastrophic ad user experience. And the majority of marketers and media executives agree with, with that, and the user experience has to change on the web. There are many reasons this is happening, but probably at the source is the rise of programmatic advertising, which has opacified the relationship between publishers and advertisers, and has multiplied the number of websites that a campaign can be delivered to. This has resulted in um, in a multiplication of web trackers that are part of, the web page, uh, uh, part of the web page as it loads, greatly slowing down the loading times, and a, uh, an increasing clutter on, on the web page, and the rise of new types of very uh, intrusive ad formats like video auto play, um, ads auto expanding, audio on, and so on and so forth. All these things have uh, enraged uh, consumers. And this has only been made, been made worse by um, by the fact that on mobile devices, now the majority of websites consume far more data for delivering ads than delivering, than delivering content, costing uh, consumers data in their data plans. And then we've seen some very high profile um, risk of infection, getting viruses, malware through, through, through websites, through ads everything, websites through these platforms. Uh, even Yahoo was infected by, by website last year, by, uh, by virus last year. So the consumer's reaction to this is to brute force everything, block all ads. And uh, that's a major threat to the industry because it completely relies on advertising for its revenue. So we need to find a solution to this. The IAB actually has, has been, uh, is very concerned about this and has been working on a set of guiding principles for the industry that they published uh, in the past uh, few months. For um, publishers, it recommends that they detect the ads uh, the ad blockers explain to consumers why they're bad, uh, ask them to stop using ad blockers, otherwise uh, access to content will be limited. And I'm sure you've all seen this. But what's new is that on the uh, advertiser side, they're also asking them to be better behaved, to switch to lighter uh, forms of ads, to encrypt them, to provide ad choices, and also to eliminate some of the uh, most uh, invasive, uh, invasive uh, ad formats like um, puppet ads and auto-expanding ads. And just last week at the DMEXCO conference in Germany, uh, they announced a, new, a coalition for better ads that brings together all the major uh, agencies around the world to implement those principles. 
So the hope is that within a year we'll see hopefully less disruptive advertising and hopefully a reduction in, in ad blocker usage. But the reality is, um, at least according to this uh, study by HubSpot, the vast majority of consumers dislike all kinds of internet ads. It's not something that, that they want. There's a couple of bright spots. Uh, search advertising, social media advertising like Facebook are better tolerated because they tend to be contextually more relevant. To be relevant, it's important to be able to target the advertisers. And unfortunately, it's not something we can do everywhere because if you start you know, identifying people everywhere they go, it becomes really creepy, like in the case of the uh, Minority Report movie where Tom Cruise walks through a shopping mall and every billboard talks to him directly. Um, I'm sure you've been to websites where you see um, products, you just browse Amazon, reappear to you. And for a lot of people, that's very invasive of their privacy. So in fact, what we need here is not just targeting. What we need is to take into account also the right place to show an ad and the right time to place an ad. In fact, uh, when you think of it, when you wanted something from uh, your parents when you were children, uh, the favor that you were asking for was just as important as the right time and place to ask for it. And I think this, uh, this principle applies to a lot of things in life, including um, 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 advertising. It all comes down, really, to treat users with respect on the web, just like we treat people with respect in real life, and to take into account their current, uh, what they're doing right now, their emotional state. I mean, are they going to be receptive to the ad you're going to show to them at this moment? That's something that's very hard to do. Well, it turns out that the virtual personal assistants that have been developed recently, like um, Apple Series, uh, Google Now, Microsoft Cortana, the upcoming Facebook M and, and, and Alexa, already solving parts of this problem. They all um, try to be kind of like real life assistants, try to be um, for high powered uh, movie executives, for example. Their job is to filter irrelevant information and to surface to you what's useful right now so you can uh, make better use of your day. To do, to do that effectively, uh, the real life assistants effectively are parts of the family. They develop an intimate knowledge of the person that they, that they work for. They know all their quirks, all their likes and dislikes. They know a ton of things that nobody else in the world should know. And their job is to protect their boss from intrusions, but at the same time protect their privacy and with, uh, the knowledge of that information about them. So it turns out the virtual personal assistants are already using a number of AI algorithms. Of course, NLP is the most commonly known, but there's a number of others that have strong overlap with the needs of, uh, of this smarter type of advertising, including interest graphs, uh, sensory inter integration, and uh, some deep knowledge of the user to be able to develop a sense of empathy. In fact, uh, you could think of these, yeah, potentially these AI algorithms could become a sort of new gatekeepers for advertising on the web. And this type of uh, gatekeeping could go well beyond the uh, virtual personal assistant apps themselves. Uh, for example, you could have in that filtering plugin that implements these, these algorithms, or we could even be part um, of the programmatic ad platforms doing filtering at the source. The plugins in particular could replace the ad blockers. So consumers instead of installing ad blockers could install a ad filtering plugin, a smart ad assistant. But just like I mentioned before, before, to be able to do this, a very deep understanding of the, of the user is needed. And uh, in real life, we hire people to do that. On the internet, we're not quite there yet. You know, what you do online, uh, the websites you browse, the mobile apps you use, the GPS location, that's not quite enough to really know you as a person. It's just a lot of things that you do offline today that are essential to, that, to, develop, to developing that knowledge. Where it turns out, Maybe the Internet of Things could be the solution. The Internet of Things is going to add billions of devices into our environment that, has, that have a lot of sensors. And a lot of these sensors could uh, produce data that could be uh, uh, used to augment the data we collect online to better uh, understand the consumers. Of course, it's not going to be the Internet of Things of the industrial side. Uh, it's going to be the Internet of Things of the, in, in the consumer space. It's going to be the consumer devices that are going to enter our homes in the form of smart home appliances, 
or the wearables are going to uh, start wearing uh, more and more often, or the connected transportation are going to be using more and more. And all of these devices, because they're close to us as people, the touch our bodies are within close distance um, of our bodies, are going to generate a lot of personal IoT data. And this is a very big deal, because according, at least according to CNN, we are at the beginning of a major data rush, where personal information about you is effectively a 21st century goal. So on the smart home side, it's all of the appliances that you use today that are going to start becoming connected to the internet and reporting how they're being used. Uh, you can already buy some of them in the form of connected uh, cooking appliances. GE just launched a whole connected line, uh, connected refrigerators, connected coffee machines, connected washer and dryers, and even connected uh, door locks. When in use, all these appliances provide uh, insights about what's happening inside the house. The fridge could even uh, potentially measure in the future what sorts of foods are inside, which provides insight of what type of diet people have. Wearables are especially interesting because they come with an increasingly large number of biometric sensors, which can be used to determine the level of activity of a user, if he's sleeping, if he's tired, um, if he's uh, active. Uh, there could be sensors that determine the heart rate, the emotional state, is he unhappy, is he stressed out, is he calm. This will help a lot to, to develop a deeper sense of empathy. And finally, outside the house, connected transportation, um, connected cars, uh, traffic lights, parking meters will provide additional information on how people live their lives outside of the house. We are still at the very beginning of this, but the expectation is actually quite high. Uh, at least the McKinsey Global Institute predicts that within 10 years, there will be enough consumer IoT devices um, in the market to cut the uh, domestic chores of the average household by 100 hours a year. So this is going to be really big very soon. And uh, it's going to gener generate a lot of data that people are not thinking about using yet. For marketers, um, this means that probably things, they will have to change the way they do business. They will have to start thinking about how to market to AI algorithms of the style that power virtual, um, virtual personal assistants. But uh, these algorithms are only going to work well if they're able to uh, collect that data from the Internet of Things. And today, that remains a major challenge. And there's many reasons for that. And probably the biggest one is that unlike the first two waves of the Internet, you know, uh, the web browser and the mobile wave, uh, which had a simple set of standards to, uh, to build on, HTML, HTTP, iOS, and Android. In the IoT space today, we have complete chaos. We have over 50 plus different standards being, de being developed in parallel around the world, and over 400 platforms. So until we get consolidation down to a few of these, it's gonna take a long time before this industry takes off. And we already see that, we've been talking about consumer devices in the space, but really today we have very few brands that have very few products that are fairly incompatible between themselves and still run proprietary code. And consumers are not jumping in because they're afraid of buying into an ecosystem that could become obsolete very quickly, buying a brick effectively. It turns out uh, the Internet of Things has been overhyped for quite a while. Uh, Gardner has put it at the peak of the hype cycle for the last four years in a row. It's just uh, updated this diagram uh, a couple of weeks ago. And the consumer side, which is the connected home, you can barely see it, um, is even earlier in this adoption cycle. It's, it's basically, it was an innovation trigger phase last year and just uh, starting to reach the peak of expectation, which means it's really reserved to, uh, to the early adopters, the people that will buy whatever comes out at, at, at any price. But it, it's still very far from crossing into the mainstream. So one uh, consequence of being this early stage is that nobody really has been working on IoT measurement frameworks for consumer data. There is some data being collected today from IoT devices, and it really is inherited from the industrial side. They measure um, what's called telemetry. They measure uh, failure conditions. When things go wrong, we want to know so they can do remote maintenance and reduce um, operational costs. But that's not the kind of data we want here. 
we don't want to know if your coffee machine is out of, is, is out of filters or if your uh, fridge is leaking. We want to know how the device is being used so we can develop insights about the household or you as a person. So uh, in the absence of uh, frameworks in place, today the only option is to do custom integrations at the firmware level with every manufacturer of IT devices. And if the expectation is that there will be billions of devices in the field in a few years, there will be clearly thousands of manufacturers, thousands of products, many, many software updates, this will just never scale. It will be impossible to manage. So the real way to do this is really to work with the IoT open standards and software platforms being developed today. And we're lucky here because we're early stage enough that none of them are already deployed in the market. All join from the OSIN Alliance and IoTBT from the OCF, uh, the Open Connectivity Foundation, a very young uh, application layer um, um, frameworks for IoT consumer devices that are still far from maturity and as, as a result uh, have not seen any deployments yet. So there's an opportunity to extend those with measurement capabilities. There is also the legacy uh, part of this industry, which really evolved from the um, um, home um, automation space and home security space. There are some legacy protocols, which I'm sure you have all heard about, ZigBee, Z-Wave, Bluetooth, which were never part of the internet, you know, they didn't have IP addresses, but are being upgraded right now to be um, part of the internet of things. The software stacks are being refreshed to support IPv6, but none of these devices, the millions and millions of them that are in the field, are software updatable. So we're gonna to have to wait for consumers to replace all of them and buy new millions of devices before we can measure them. So in both uh, cases, we are many, we're just we're still years away from measuring them. And maybe, so maybe, maybe we should, instead of looking at standards, we could also be looking at operating systems. It turns out uh, Android, Windows, and OpenWRT are all making inroads in this space. A lot of devices are, are using them. Uh, some are open source, like OpenWRT, which is a Linux-based OS using uh, a lot of Wi-Fi routers and pretty much all the IT gateways. And uh, maybe that's where we could um, um, add measurement. Uh, OpenWRT is especially interesting because when you look at the smart home, um, even though these devices are called Internet of Things devices, majority of them will, ne will not connect directly to the Internet. Uh, think of a of a light switch that needs to talk to a light bulb. If you have to send a signal all the way up into the cloud and wait for it to come down to turn on the light bulb, there will be a delay. So we don't want to do that. We want to talk directly to each other, peer-to-peer, -peer, over a local network, which means you need to have a gateway to facilitate this direct uh, commu um, uh, communication. Also, uh, the smart home needs to be able to function if the internet goes down. If you lose your internet, you don't want your lights to stop working or your fridge to stop working. So uh, all of this um, consumer internet is going to be really a lot of private edge networks that interface with the cloud only when needed and not as the primary model of operation via gateways, which means these gateways will see all the local traffic and are, in fact, an ideal place to do this type of measurement. And of course, OpenWT is again the best candidate there. So assuming we can get to the data, which is not something we can do yet, but assuming we can get to it, we're still gonna face a major other problem, which is the lack of a common data taxonomy. I talked about how we have uh, 50 plus different standards and 400 plus different platforms, but if they all generate data in a different way, it's gonna be a complete nightmare, even if you can get to it. What we really need is a common data standard. If we all generate the same data, in fact, it doesn't matter if we have to use 400 different APIs to get to it, at least it will mean the same thing and we'll be able to fuse it and use it for um, data uh, analytics. Uh, as an example, imagine a, a one brand of, of freeze, uh, of, a, of, of, a free, of a fridge that has the freezer door open. Uh, if that fridge sends a message that says freezer door open, or a different brand of fridge uh, sends a message that says freezer temperature dropping fast, which is a consequence of the door being open, uh, it's going to be hard to integrate. You have to know what uh, uh, you have to know the taxonomy of every class of device, and it's just not ideal. 
So how do we get to a standard for um, a data standard for IoT consumer devices? Well, it turns out there's already some uh, efforts going on in this space. The Oasis community uh, in Europe has been working on something like that for two, three years already. It's called the classification of everyday living. What they've done is they've looked at what a typical person does throughout um, his day. And uh, I've created the hierarchy of everything you can do. So, you know, um, eating, sleeping, climbing stairs, you know, everything, you name it. If we extend this to also include all of the use cases for consumer devices, then we, uh, we could have a complete taxonomy on how every product is being used uh, around us in, in everyday life. Today, we only have about 3,000 events, which is far from enough. If we could grow this to maybe uh, 50,000 or 100,000 events, then we could cover the entire space and have a data standard for, for this industry. And the last thing that we need, um, once we know, assuming we can collect data and we know um, how it's being used, we still need to know who is using those devices. Uh, usage data is useless to advertisers if they don't understand demographics. Advertisers buy demographic segments. You know, they buy the household that drives BMWs and likes to exercise and likes to eat pizza. That's what they buy. So we, we need to be able to layer on top of that uh, an understanding of the demographics. On, on mobile and PCs, it's fairly easy because we have cookies, we have logins, so we can identify users. But on your fridge, on your uh, coffee machine, these are shared uh, devices. The devices don't know who's using them. It turns out uh, at Nielsen, um, has been working on this problem for, for quite a while. In fact, we, we are some of the best in the world to uh, layer demographic data on top of any um, measurement from uh, any partner that we work with. And we have developed something called the Nielsen Census Methodology. It's, uh, it's used in the Nielsen Total Audience Reports uh, for PCs, mobile devices, and tablets. So a device in the field used by millions of people as well on the, shopping, on the, on the buy side for, for shopping data. And it could be extended for the Internet of Things. So this is not something, by the way, that we have today. It's something I'm proposing could be done to address this space. The way this would work is on top of the uh, basic census measurement, so collecting data from devices, usage data, PC, mobile, and IoT, it would layer on top uh, a new step, which is called an IoT device graph. What this does is it uh, looks at, uh, at IP addresses,